The MCRCA adopted the romanticized figure of the Aztec warrior as the core symbol of Mexican ethnic identity. And the group had its main influence in urban middle and working class communities. Its practices mixed Mexican nationalism, neo-Aztec religion, also prominently influenced by new age ideas, the use and promotion of the classical Nahuatl language, including the practitioners taking Nahuatl names and a new form of Aztec dance. In his book, Nieva Lopez claims that the declaration of Cuauhtémoc was revealed to him by Estanislao Ramírez Ruiz, a chemical engineer from Tláhuac and a participant in the investigation of Cuauhtémoc's alleged tomb at Ixcatiopan, and that Ramírez had himself received the tradition from his parents. Nieva Lopez adds that he wrote it down with the help of Nahuatl speakers from Tepoztlan and the Huasteca. Now, if the declaration was indeed passed along to Nieva Lopez by Estanislao Ramirez, why is it never mentioned in any of the documents written by or about Ramirez? Also worth mentioning is the notable absence of the alleged declaration in any respectable history book or collection of indigenous literature. Surely a work of such profound historical significance would merit a place in scholarship dealing with the fall of Mexico Tenochtitlan. Also, why wait until after Ramirez had died to reveal the declaration? These questions alone are enough to cast doubt upon the declaration's authenticity. Now, just for brevity's sake, we're not going to go through Dr. Hansen's entire linguistic analysis, but I would like to present four main points that Magnus found. Point one, the Nahuatl text is a translation of the Spanish text and not the reverse. Point two, the translator was not a native Nahuatl speaker, but had probably studied some classical Nahuatl and occasionally used a colonial dictionary in producing the translation. Point three, many word forms are different from their forms in colonial Nahuatl and suggest that the translator may have been familiar with a 20th century colloquial variety of Nahuatl, or that the translator may have had help from native speakers to help with the translation of specific parts of the Spanish original. The arbitrary division of words also suggests that the translator, after hearing them from an oral source, perhaps a native speaker, wrote down the phrase by phrase or word by word direct translations. Point four, the entire grammatical and syntactic structure of the text is atypical for both colonial and modern Nahuatl, and it does not show either the rhetorical traits commonly associated with early colonial Nahuatl oratory or the kind of formulaic language that would suggest an oral source of transmission, e.g. repetition, simple short phrases, topic, comment, cohesion. Consequently, we can conclude that the text was most likely not passed down through oral tradition directly from Cuauhtémoc, but that it was probably produced in Southern Mexico by Rodolfo Nieva López and Estanislao Ramírez with the aid of some of their Nahuatl-speaking associates in the 1960s. While many cultural educators and practitioners of Aztec dance may certainly draw inspiration from the alleged declaration, it is without historical merit. Further distribution of the document is discouraged as doing so only encourages the propagation of pseudo-history and ignores the actual cultural inheritance of Mexico's indigenous people. If we truly desire a powerful message of resistance and resilience passed down by our ancestors, personally, I highly recommend that the declaration be replaced with the following excerpt from Alvarado de Sosomoc's Crónica Mexicayo as this message is far more inspiring, and most importantly, it is not a work of fiction. Thus they have come to tell it. Thus they have come to record it in their narration. 
and for us to have painted it in their codices, the ancient men, the ancient women. They were our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our great grandfathers, great grandmothers, our great great grandfathers, our ancestors. Their account was repeated. They left it to us. They bequeathed it forever to us who live now, to us who come from them. Never will it be lost. Never will it be forgotten. That which they came to do, that which they came to record in their paintings, their renown, their history, their memory. Thus in the future, never will it perish. Never will it be forgotten. Always we will treasure it. We, their children, their grandchildren, brothers, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, descendants, we who carry their blood and their color, we will tell it. We will pass it on to those who do not yet live, who are yet to be born, the children of the Mexicans, the children of the Tenochcans. I got to admit, this one, this one hurt. <laughs> like, I really wanted this to be real when I was young. Like, I think we all did. I mean, uh, we've kind of had discussions about this off and on over the years. And, and you know, this is one of those that, that was very inspirational to a lot of us young Chicanos and, you know, especially those of us that came of age in the 90s, uh, you know, during the the sort of uh, the renewal of the Chicano, the brief renewal of the Chicano movement, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, I think, as we've discussed before briefly and, you know, the Zapatistas uh, in 94 and then the, the response to the 1992 you know, quincentennial celebrations of Columbus and all the uproar that that ensued because of these celebrations and and I think going back to the 80s and even going back to the 70s you had people who were already sort of promoting these ideas that that are sort of tied to a sense of like a prophetic vision right I mean yeah 